Chapter 9 My room, then. There has to be some space, finally, that I claim as mine, even in this time. I'm waiting in my room, which right now is a waiting room. When I go to bed, it's a bedroom. The curtains are still wavering in the small wind. The sun outside is still shining, though not in through the window directly. It has moved west. I am trying not to tell stories, or at any rate, not this one. Someone has lived in this room before me. Someone like me, or I prefer to believe so. I discovered it three days after I was moved here. I had a lot of time to pass. I decided to explore the room, not hastily, as one would explore a hotel room, expecting no surprise, opening and shutting the desk drawers, the cupboard doors, unwrapping the tiny individually wrapped bar of soap, prodding the pillows. Will I ever be in a hotel room again? How I wasted them, those rooms, that freedom from being seen, rented license. In the afternoons, when Luke was still in flight from his wife, when I was still imaginary for him, before we were married and I solidified, I would always get there first, check in. It wasn't that many times, but it seems now like a decade, an era. I can remember what I wore, each blouse, each scarf. I would pace, waiting for him, turn the television on and then off, Dab behind my ears with perfume. Opium, it was. It came in a Chinese bottle, red and gold. I was nervous. How was I to know he loved me? It might be just an affair. Why did we ever say just? Though at that time, men and women tried each other on casually, like suits, rejecting whatever did not fit. The knock would come at the door. I'd open with relief desire. He was so momentary, so condensed, and yet there seemed no end to him. We would lie in those afternoon beds afterwards, hands on each other, talking it over, possible, impossible. What could be done? We thought we had such problems. How were we to know we were happy? But now, it's the rooms themselves I miss as well. Even the dreadful paintings that hung on the walls, landscapes with fall foliage or snow melting in hardwoods, or women in period costume with china doll faces and bustles and parasols, or sad-eyed clowns, or bowls of fruit, stiff and chalky looking, the fresh towels ready for spoilage, the waste baskets gaping their invitations, beckoning in the careless junk careless. I was careless in those rooms. I could lift the telephone and food would appear on a tray. Food I had chosen. Food that was bad for me, no doubt, and drink too. There were Bibles in the dresser drawers, put there by some charitable society, though probably no one read them very much. There were postcards too, with pictures of the hotel on them, and you could write on the postcards and send them to anyone you wanted. Seems like such an impossible thing now, like something you'd make up. So, I explored this room, not hastily then, like a hotel room, wasting it. I didn't want to do it all at once. I wanted to make it last. I divided the room into sections in my head. I allowed myself one section a day. This one section I would examine with the greatest minuteness. The unevenness of the plaster under the wallpaper the scratches in the paint of the baseboard and the windowsill, under the top coat of paint, the stains on the mattress, for I went so far as to lift the blankets and sheets from the bed, fold them back, a little at a time, so they could be replaced quickly if anyone came. The stains on the mattress, like dried flower petals, not recent, old love. There's no other kind of love in this room now. When I saw that, that evidence left by two people, of love or something like it, desire at least, at least touch, between two people, now perhaps old or dead. I covered the bed again, 
and lay down on it. I looked up at the blind plaster eye in the ceiling. I wanted to feel Luke lying beside me. I have them, these attacks of the past, like faintness, a wave sweeping over my head. Sometimes it can hardly be born. What is to be done? What is to be done, I thought. There is nothing to be done. They also serve who only stand and wait, or lie down and wait. I know why the glass in the window is shatterproof, and why they took down the chandelier. I wanted to feel Luke lying beside me but there wasn't room. I saved the cupboard until the third day. I looked carefully over the door first, inside and out, then the walls with their brass hooks. How could they have overlooked the hooks? Why didn't they remove them? Too close to the floor? But still, a stocking. That's all you'd need. And the rod with the plastic hangers. My dress is hanging on them. The red woolen cape for cold weather. The shawl. I knelt to examine the floor, and there it was, in tiny writing. Quite fresh, it seemed. Scratched with a pin or maybe just a fingernail. In the corner where the darkest shadow fell. Nolide de Bastardes, Carper and Dora. I didn't know what it meant, or even what language it was in. I thought it might be Latin, but I didn't know any Latin. Still, it was a message and it was in writing, forbidden by that very fact, and it hadn't yet been discovered, except by me, for whom it was intended. It was intended for whoever came next. It pleases me to ponder this message. It pleases me to think I'm communing with her, this unknown woman, for she is unknown, or if known, she has never been mentioned to me. It pleases me to know that her taboo message made it through to at least one other person, washed itself up on the wall of my cupboard, was opened and read by me. Sometimes I repeat the words to myself. They give me a small joy. When I imagine the woman who wrote them, I think of her as about my age, maybe a little younger. I turn her into Moira, Moira as she was when she was in college in the room next to mine, quirky, jaunty, athletic, with a bicycle once, and a knapsack for hiking. Freckles, I think. Irreverent, resourceful. I wonder who she was, or is, and what's become of her. I tried that out on Rita the day I found the message. Who was the woman who stayed in that room, I said, before me? If I'd asked it differently, if I had said... Was there a woman who stayed in that room before me? I might not have got anywhere. Which one, she said. She sounded grudging, suspicious, but then she almost always sounds like that when she speaks to me. So there have been more than one. Some haven't stayed their full term of posting, their full two years. Some have been sent away for one reason or another, or maybe not sent. Gone? The lively one, I was guessing. The one with freckles. You knew her? Rita asked, more suspicious than ever. I knew her before. I lied. I heard she was here. Rita accepted this. She knows there must be a grapevine, an underground of sorts. She didn't work out, she said. In what way? I asked, trying to sound as neutral as possible. But Rita clamped her lips together. I'm like a child here. There are some things I must not be told. What you don't know won't hurt you, was all she would say. 